This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 A Prisoner We had gone perhaps ten miles when the ground began to rise very rapidly. We were, as I was later to learn, nearing the edge of one of Ma's long dead seas, in the bottom of which my encounter with the Martians had taken place. In a short time we gained the foot of the mountains, and after traversing a narrow gorge came to an open valley, at the far extremity of which was a low table land upon which I had beheld an enormous city. Toward this we galloped, entering it by what appeared to be a ruined roadway leading out from the city, but only to the edge of the tableland where it ended abruptly in a flight of broad steps. Upon closer observation I saw as we passed them that the buildings were deserted, and while not greatly decayed had the appearance of not having been tenanted for years, possibly for ages. Toward the center of the city was a large plaza, and upon this, and in the buildings immediately surrounding it, were camped some nine or ten hundred creatures of the same breed as my captors, for such I now considered them, despite the suave manner in which I had been trapped. With the exception of their ornaments all were naked, the women varied in appearance but little from the men, except that their tusks were much larger in proportion to their height, in some instances curving nearly to the high-set ears. Their bodies were smaller and lighter in color, and their fingers and toes bore the rudiments of nails, which were entirely lacking among the males. The adult females ranged in height from ten to twelve feet. The children were light in color, even lighter than the women, and all looked precisely alike to me, except that some were taller than the others, older, I presumed. I saw no signs of extreme age among them, nor is there any appreciable difference in their appearance from the age of maturity, about forty, until, at about the age of one thousand years, they go voluntarily upon their last strange pilgrimage down the river ice, which leads no living Martian nose whither, and from whose bosom no Martian has ever returned, or would be allowed to live did he return after once embarking upon its cold, dark waters. Only about one Martian in a thousand dies of sickness or disease, and possibly about twenty take the voluntary pilgrimage. The other nine hundred and seventy-nine die violent deaths in duels, in hunting, in aviation, and in war, but perhaps by far the greatest death loss comes during the age of childhood, when vast numbers of the little Martians fall victim to the great white apes of Mars. The average life expectancy of a Martian after the age of maturity is about three hundred years, but would be nearer the one thousand mark were it not for the various means leading to violent death. Owing to the waning resources of the planet, it evidently became necessary to counteract the increasing longevity which their remarkable skill in therapeutics and surgery produced. And so, human life has come to be considered but lightly on Mars, as is evidenced by the dangerous sports and the almost continual warfare between the various communities. There are other and natural causes tending toward diminution of population, but nothing contributes so greatly to this end as the fact that no male or female Martian is ever voluntarily without a weapon of destruction. As we neared the plaza and my presence was discovered, we were immediately surrounded by hundreds of the creatures who seemed anxious to pluck me from my seat behind my guard. A word from the leader of the party stilled their clamor and we proceeded at a trot across the plaza to the entrance of as magnificent an edifice as mortal eye has rested upon. The building was low but covered an enormous area. It was constructed of gleaming white marble inlaid with gold and brilliant stones which sparkled and scintillated in the sunlight. The main entrance was some hundred feet in width and projected from the building proper to form a huge canopy above the entrance hall. There was no stairway, but a gentle incline to the first floor of the building opened into an enormous chamber encircled by galleries. On the floor of this chamber, which was dotted with highly carved wooden desks and chairs, 
were assembled about forty or fifty male Martians around the steps of a rostrum. On the platform proper squatted an enormous warrior heavily loaded with metal ornaments, gay-colored feathers, and beautifully wrought leather trappings ingeniously set with precious stones. From his shoulders depended a short cape of white fur lined with brilliant scarlet silk. What struck me as most remarkable about this assemblage and the hall in which they were congregated was the fact that the creatures were entirely out of proportion to the desks, chairs, and other furnishings. These being of a size adapted to human beings such as I, whereas the great bulks of the Martians could scarcely have squeezed into the chairs, nor was there room beneath the desk for their long legs. Evidently, then, there were other denizens of Mars than the wild and grotesque creatures into whose hands I had fallen, but the evidences of extreme antiquity which showed all around me indicated that these buildings might have belonged to some long extinct and forgotten race in the dim antiquity of Mars. Our party had halted at the entrance to the building, and at a sign from the leader I had been lowered to the ground, again locking his arm in mine, we had proceeded into the audience chamber. There were few formalities observed in approaching the Martian chieftain. My captain merely strode up to the rostrum, the others making way for him as he advanced. The chieftain rose to his feet and uttered the name of my escort, who, in turn, halted and repeated the name of the ruler, followed by his title. At the time, this ceremony and the words they uttered meant nothing to me. But later I came to know that this was the customary greeting between green Martians. Had the men been strangers, and therefore unable to exchange names, they would have silently exchanged ornaments had their missions been peaceful. Otherwise, they would have exchanged shots, or have fought out their introduction with some other of their various weapons. My captor, whose name was Tars Tarkas, was virtually the vice-chieftain of the community, and a man of great ability as a statesman and warrior. He evidently explained briefly the incidents connected with his expedition, including my capture, and when he had concluded the chieftain addressed me at some length. I replied in our good old English tongue merely to convince him that neither of us could understand the other, but I noticed that when I smiled slightly on concluding he did likewise. This fact, and the similar occurrence, during my first talk with Tars Tarkas, convinced me that we had at least something in common, the ability to smile, therefore to laugh, denoting a sense of humor. But I was to learn that the Martian smile is merely perfunctory, and that the Martian laugh is a thing to cause strong men to blanch in horror. The ideas of humor among these green men of Mars are widely at variance with our conceptions of incidents to merriment. The death agonies of a fellow being are, to these strange creatures, provocative of the wildest hilarity, while their chief form of commonest amusement is to inflict death on their prisoners of war in various ingenious and horrible ways. The assembled warriors and chieftains examined me closely, feeling my muscles and the texture of my skin. The principal chieftain then evidently signified a desire to see me perform and, motioning me to follow, he started with Tars Tarkas for the open plaza. Now I had made no attempt to walk since my first signal failure, except while tightly grasping Tars Tarkas's arm. And so now I went skipping and flitting about among the desks and chairs like some monstrous grasshopper. After bruising myself severely, much to the amusement of the Martians, I again had recourse to creeping. But this did not suit them, and I was roughly jerked to my feet by a towering fellow who had laughed most heartily at my misfortunes. As he banged me down upon my feet, his face bent close to mine, and I did the only thing a gentleman might do under the circumstances of brutality, boorishness, and lack of consideration for a stranger's rights. I swung my fist squarely to his jaw, and he went down like a felled ox. As he sunk to the floor, I wheeled around with my back toward the nearest desk, expecting to be overwhelmed by the vengeance of his fellows. 
but determined to give them as good a battle as the unequal odds would permit before I gave up my life. My fears were groundless, however, as the other Martians, at first struck dumb with wonderment, finally broke into wild peals of laughter and applause. I did not recognize the applause as such, but later, when I had become acquainted with their customs, I learned that I had won what they seldom accord a manifestation of approbation. The fellow whom I had struck lay where he had fallen, nor did any of his mates approach him. Tars Tarkas advanced toward me, holding out one of his arms, and we thus proceeded to the plaza without further mishap. I did not, of course, know the reason for which we had come to the open, but I was not long in being enlightened. They first repeated the word sack a number of times, and then Tars Tarkas made several jumps, repeating the same word before each leap. Then, turning to me, he said, Sack. I saw what they were after, and gathering myself together, I sacked with such marvelous success that I cleared a good hundred and fifty feet. Nor did I this time lose my equilibrium, but landed squarely upon my feet without falling. I then returned by easy jumps of twenty-five or thirty feet to the little group of warriors. My exhibition had been witnessed by several hundred lesser Martians, and they immediately broke into demands for repetition, which the chieftain then ordered me to make. But I was both hungry and thirsty, and determined on the spot that my only method of salvation was to demand the consideration from these creatures, which they evidently would not voluntarily accord. I therefore ignored the repeated commands to suck and each time they were made, I motioned to my mouth and rubbed my stomach. Tars Tarkas and the chief exchanged a few words, and the former, calling to a young female among the throng, gave her some instructions and motioned me to accompany her. I grasped her proffered arm, and together we crossed the plaza toward a large building on the far side. My fair companion was about eight feet tall, having just arrived at maturity, but not yet to her full height. She was of a light olive-green color, with a smooth, glossy hide. Her name, as I afterward learned, was Sola, and she belonged to the retinue of Tars Tarkas. She conducted me to a spacious chamber in one of the buildings fronting on the plaza, and which, from the litter of silks and furs upon the floor, I took to be the sleeping quarters of several of the natives. The room was well lighted by a number of large windows, and was beautifully decorated with mural paintings and mosaics, but upon all these seemed to rest that indefinable touch of the finger of antiquity which convinced me that the architects and the builders of these wondrous creations had nothing in common with the crude half-brutes which now occupied them. Sola motioned me to be seated upon a pile of silks near the center of the room, and turning, made a peculiar hissing sound as though signaling to someone in an adjoining room. In response to her call, I obtained my first sight of a new Martian wonder. It waddled in on its ten short legs and squatted down before the girl like an obedient puppy. The thing was about the size of a Shetland pony, but its head bore a slight resemblance to that of a frog, except that the jaws were equipped with three rows of long, sharp tusks.